Gia and Amber. What is Amber? The Geological Survey of Spain is a public research institution. Studies and activities related to earth sciences and technologies are carried out in it. The Geo Minero Museum forms part of this institution and conserves important collections of fossils, minerals, and rocks. What's more, it carries out educational programs in the form of guided tours, courses, workshops, and... Hey, Gia, what are you doing here? Hello, I came to the museum to participate in the activities. And are you learning a lot? Yes, I just love geology. And look, my friends gave me this cool amber pin. I'd like to know more about amber. All I know is that it's smooth, it's light, and it has a yellow color. Did you know that this museum has a display case full of pieces of amber? I'm going to see it right now. Oh, there's so many pieces. I can see that you're very interested in learning things about amber. Did you know that the amber that we know comes from many places around the world? The most important deposits are located in the Baltic region, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, the United States, Canada, Myanmar, Lebanon. Don't we have amber in Spain? We certainly do. We have very important deposits. One of them was discovered just recently in Cantabria, near the cave of El Soplao. Quite large pieces have been found there. Look at this one. You're right. And I see that it's 110 million years old. That's a long time. What would Spain have been like in that period? Okay, Gia, open your ears and pay attention, because I'm going to tell you a very curious story. But first I want to know more about this mineral. <laughs> Don't be impatient, Gia. The first thing you have to know is that amber is not a mineral. It's fossilized resin produced by trees. Did you know that in New Zealand you can find the trees that are the most similar to the ones that gave rise to amber during the Cretaceous period? They're enormous! What are they? They're called kauri pines. Kauris are ancient trees that today produce large quantities of resin. Scientists think that during the Cretaceous period, 110 million years ago, Spain was home to very similar trees that produced the thick and sticky resin that eventually became the pieces of amber that you saw in the museum. You can see black stuff inside some of the pieces. Of course, Gia. Amber is a fossilized resin in which lots of insects were trapped on occasions because it was very sticky. So what I saw inside the amber were bugs? How interesting. The process of fossilization. I'm going to explain to you the process of fossilization that led to the formation of the amber. To understand this process, you should keep in mind two things. The nature of resin, that is, its composition and its physical properties. And geological time, which is measured in millions of years. Okay. Let's start. The first thing that you should know is that some trees produce resin to plug up their wounds, like, for example, broken branches, blows to the trunk, holes produced by animals, or roots that are left exposed. That's how they prevent infections and promote healing. This resin comes to the surface and acts like a sticky trap that catches insects, spiders. Oh, but aren't spiders insects? No, Gia. Spiders have eight legs and insects have six. Thanks to that very simple feature, it's quite easy to tell spiders from insects. The next time I run into a bug, I'll count its legs. That way you're sure to get it right. Well, as I was saying, Pieces of plants, hair, and feathers also appear in amber. Sometimes even small amphibians, reptiles, or mammals are preserved in amber, although that's less common. You mean that sometimes vertebrates are found in amber? But how can that happen? I'll give you an example. A little tropical frog appeared in some amber in the Dominican Republic. Scientists think that it jumped and landed on a lump of resin. 
They've also found very well-preserved lizards. I thought you could only find tiny bugs in amber. Well, now you see that's not always the case. But let's continue with our story. Normally, the resin that the tree has produced gradually dries out and hardens. And then it falls from the tree to the forest floor. So, this is when fossilization takes place? Not so fast, Gia. The resin's journey has only just begun. Leaves and dirt swept up by the wind and the rain fall on top of these lumps deposited at the feet of the trees so that they cover them. They gradually bury them little by little, and they stay there for years. Sometimes the forests with resin-producing trees are destroyed by some kind of catastrophe, like a forest fire, a flood, or if they're near the sea, a tsunami. And then what happens? Well, in these circumstances, the resin that was buried near the trees is left exposed and is washed away by water to more distant areas, like a river delta or the seashore. And it's deposited there and is buried again. If the resin lumps stay buried in these sedimentary basins for millions of years, they transform into amber. Millions of years? That's a long, long time. Yes, Gia. I've told you before that fossilization is a process that requires a lot of time to take place. And if instead of millions, only thousands of years go by, will it still produce amber? In that case, the resin that is only partially transformed because not enough time has gone by is given the name of copal. Usually, copal appears mixed with the remains of the plants from the forest where it was produced. I think I understand now. All amber was once copal first, right? Very good, Gia. That's the idea. And is there any copal in Spain? No. Nope. What we have in Spain is amber, one of the oldest kinds found anywhere in the world. And what parts of Spain is it found in? In various places, which are called deposits. We're going to visit some of them so that you can see what amber looks like in rocks. Amber in Spain. We're in Sant Just, in the province of Teruel, where there is a very important amber deposit in a coal mining area. That's why the rocks are the color black. Correct, Gia. You know that coal has been used in power plants to produce electricity by burning it. Nowadays, we tend to use non-polluting renewable sources of energy, like wind power. Notice that from the Sant Just amber deposit, you've got a panoramic view of these two energy resources both coal and wind. It's amazing to me that thanks to this piece of coal, we can power a light bulb. I'm going to take it home for my collection. You can take it because there's no reason to prohibit you from taking a piece of rock. Now we're at the Cortes de Arenoso outcrop. There's a cave here. No, Gia. It's a hole dug out by the shepherds in the area to mine the amber. So the shepherds were interested in amber? Yes, but not from a scientific point of view, but rather to burn it in their campfires like incense. Well, here's a pretty piece of amber. I'll take this home too. No, leave it where it is. The law is very clear with respect to our paleontological heritage. Only scientists are authorized to remove and study fossils and to store them in a museum later. As you're going to see, some deposits enjoy special protection because of their scientific importance. I'm in Peñaterrada with a paleontologist studying this deposit. It's a real privilege that they've allowed you access to such an important deposit. 
As you've seen, it's protected by a fence, and that's because it's a BIC, that is, an asset of cultural interest. They gave us special permission to take samples of the stratum with amber. It's this darker colored layer that stands out among all the rest. This stratum is darker because it contains coal and other microscopic plant remains. Like, for example, grains of pollen and spores. And what are such tiny fossils good for? This pollen is very important in order to know both the age of the deposits and the plants that lived in the province of Alava in the age of the dinosaurs. An attractive substance. What uses does amber have? Amber has been used since antiquity to make ornaments, jewelry, and amulets. In fact, Carved pieces of amber have even been found in prehistoric caves in northern Spain. And why was amber so popular for making ornaments? Because of its physical properties. Notice that amber is very light, soft, and semi-transparent, and it comes in very striking colors. It also has a very unexpected property. Gia, rub the piece you've got and hold it close to those little pieces of paper. What happens? It attracts the pieces of paper. It's like magic. This effect is due to static electricity, since you charged the amber with electrons when you rubbed it. In fact, the term electricity comes from the name that the ancient Greeks gave to amber. Electron. The ancient civilizations also thought that they saw magical properties in amber. And that's why it was their favorite substance to make amulets. And there are still people who believe in the magical properties of minerals. Properties which obviously don't exist. But then, in ancient times, didn't they think that amber was a fossilized resin? No. They believed that they were the tears of mythological characters or lynx urine. The Romans valued amber very highly. This lovely amber doll was found in the tomb of a Roman child in the province of Albacete. I didn't know that Roman children played with dolls, much less with ones made of amber. But amber is more than that. When we study it scientifically, it provides us with very valuable information about life in the past and about the process of evolution. The first step is to dig it up. Let's go see how it's done. Mining Amber. I'm at the paleontological excavation of Esselplau outcrop. I'm told it's one of the most important amber outcrops in Europe. That's right, Gia. Special methods are used to mine the amber here so that it isn't damaged. They use high-pressure jets of water to break up the sedimentary rock, which is later sifted in order to recover even the smallest pieces. The water has uncovered an enormous piece of amber, but it's blue-colored. One of the peculiarities of this deposit is that the amber looks blue when it's hit by sunlight. This is due to a phenomenon called Luminescence. I'm going to try to find a piece like that. What are these? They look like leaves. Right again, Gia. They're the remains of plants. These rocks also contain the leaves and stalks of conifers, possibly of the trees that produced the resin that gave rise to the amber of Elsoplau. This is fascinating. I want to be a paleontologist. I know what you mean, Gia. This deposit has created great expectation in the scientific community because of the large volume of amber that it's yielding and because the fossils it contains are so exceptionally well-preserved. But what really grabs my attention is the presence of fossils inside the amber. By the way, I didn't see any of the deposit. Those fossils are very important because they're very rare and they're usually of unknown species. The amber has to go through a long preparatory process in the laboratory in order for us to see them well, and in order for scientists to be able to study them in detail. 
I'd like to see that, too. Then let's go to the laboratory at the Natural Science Museum of Alava. Research. Here they do research similar to the kind carried out at the Geological Survey of Spain. The first thing they do is observe the pieces of amber with powerful magnifying glasses to find any possible arthropods. That's not an easy task because amber is a little dark and normally you have to cut it up to ensure that it has all been thoroughly inspected. The fossils found are very small and it's important to gradually reduce the size of the piece of amber that they're in. That way they are isolated so that they're much easier to see. The next process is to enclose them in a synthetic resin while in a vacuum to prevent bubbles from forming. Once it is hardened, the resin is cut with a jeweler's saw and it's given a final polishing. Can I see the insects now? Because they're very small, we have to see them with the aid of a microscope. You'll see how all the details are preserved that allow scientists to determine which groups the specimens belong to, and in many cases, to describe them as new species. Specimens? I'm referring to insects and spiders, what in zoology we call arthropods, and also some feathers and plant remains. I'm going to explain to you in greater detail what kinds of arthropods are found most often in the Cretaceous Amber in Spain. By the way, Gia, do you know what the word arthropod means? Well, no, I have no idea. It literally means jointed foot. If you look closely at the leg of an insect or of a crab, you'll see that it's formed by several segments and that between the segments there is a joint that allows them great mobility. Today, arthropods are one of the most diverse and numerous groups of organisms, and they include animals that are very familiar to all of us. For example, butterflies, shrimp, centipedes, scorpions, tarantulas, crabs, grasshoppers, flies, bedbugs, wasps, and bees. Other well-known arthropods that became extinct 250 million years ago are trilobites. You mean cockroaches are arthropods too? Yes, Gia. They're one of the oldest groups of arthropods that we know of. And many of them have been found in rocks from the Carboniferous period, and also in amber from the Cretaceous. And what are the most abundant arthropods? Most of the specimens are diptera, which are flies and mosquitoes. We found many species of diptera, and some very strange ones too. There are also lots of hymenoptera, mainly wasps that parasitize other insects. How do you know they were parasites? Because at the end of their abdomen, the females have a sort of small stinger, called an ovipositor, which it uses to inject its eggs into the eggs laid by its victims. By introducing one egg inside another, a different insect will hatch from the one that was expected. It's like if a sparrow hatched from a chicken egg. Can you imagine that? That's strange. And what other arthropods can we find in Cretaceous Amber? Let's take this step by step. Arthropods are divided into several groups, and many of them are found in Amber in Spain. Among the insects, we found flies and mosquitoes, wasps, cockroaches, beetles, aphids, and grasshoppers. Among the arachnids, we found many mites and interesting spiders. Did the spiders of the Cretaceous also make spider webs? You know, Gia, the oldest known spider web was found precisely in the Sant Juice deposit, and several insects were trapped in it. It was a very important discovery and appeared in the newspapers. It turns out that very ancient spider webs were like today's spiral shaped webs, the ones called orbicular webs. Look, Gia. This fly has a mite stuck on one leg. It was feeding on it when they were both trapped in the resin, and they died together. It's a rare example of parasitism in the fossil record. Sucking on the leg of a fly? That's gross. For you it is, but to a mite a fly must taste delicious. You told me before that they've also found feathers in amber. Yes, Gia. 
Some feathers have been found, but we don't know if they belong to feathered dinosaurs or to the first birds we know of. You can see them really well. Sometimes we find unique specimens, and therefore ones that are very important for research, in very cloudy or altered amber. In those cases, it's possible to use a recent high-technology technique called X-ray computed tomography with a synchrotron, which is a kind of particle accelerator. Would you like to see a tomographic image of a spider in Cretaceous amber taken by the French synchrotron at Grenoble? Yeah! This high-resolution three-dimensional image shows all the external and internal details of the fossil so that we can carry out more exhaustive research than we can with microscopes in order to identify specimens in transparent amber. You said it preserves the internal parts, too. I thought the insides of these fossils were also full of amber. Some are, but usually they're hollow. Although a few specimens preserve some soft tissues, like muscles with their cell structure. Of course. And their DNA will be preserved in those fossilized tissues. I saw that in a movie. Scientists were looking in amber for mosquitoes that had bitten dinosaurs in the Jurassic period. Then they took the blood out of their bodies and managed to get the DNA. With that, they made new dinosaurs and... No, Gia. What you're telling me is, in fact, just a film. It's been demonstrated that DNA can be at most a few thousand years old because it's a very complex and very delicate molecule. Not even the exceptional conservation in amber has managed to preserve DNA. What it does always preserve very well is the exoskeletons of those arthropods, which in reality is what we see through the surface of the amber. Well, I believed the story that dinosaurs could come back to life. Oh well. So how many species can we find in amber? Lots. Because in the ecosystems on land during the Cretaceous, insects were the dominant group. Actually, today it's the same. It's estimated that today there are several million species of insects living on Earth. The variety of the forms of life that exist is what we call biodiversity. In some ecosystems, lots of species live together, and these are called biodiversity hotspots, like the tropical forests. Do the insects we find in amber exist today? No. They all became extinct millions of years ago. So those insects belong to unknown species. Many of the ones found in Spanish amber are the oldest ones we know of in their group, and therefore very valuable fossils because of what they can tell us about their origin. In short, Gia, they're very important to the efforts to learn more about the surprising process of the evolution of life on Earth. Final Summary Paleontologists don't just collect pieces of amber. They also carry out detailed studies of the deposits. In other words, of the characteristics of the strata, of where the lumps of amber appear, and of the associated fossils. Paleontological research allows scientists to reconstruct the conditions of the ecosystems that existed in the past, the interactions among the organisms that lived in them, and the ways in which they are related. The information obtained is important, even though it may not have an immediate practical application because it represents great progress in our knowledge of the planet's past. Today in the Geological Survey of Spain, Numerous research projects are being carried out to learn more about the country's amber deposits. I've learned that paleontological digs have to be protected and that there are laws that regulate fossil collection. I've also realized how important museums are as institutions that preserve our national heritage. After my experience at the dig, I know that all the data obtained are important and complement one another. They're the pieces to a puzzle that scientists gradually reconstruct as their research advances. We can't forget that the story that they want to tell happened many millions of years ago.